This is section 2.6, an introduction to logarithms. We're going to start by looking at a familiar function, the exponential growth function, f of x equals 2 to the x. And I've just got a little table of values here. Um, I've kind of pre-filled in the y values, but just notice that 2 to the negative 2, remember, is really 1 over 2 squared, or 1 fourth. 2 to the negative 1 is really 1 over 2 to the first, 1 half. And 2 to the 0 is 1. 2 to the first is 2. 2 squared is 4. And 2 cubed is 8. The first question that I'd like to investigate is, is this a one-to-one -one function? If we were to go ahead and graph that function on our calculator, we really kind of already know what it looks like. But let's just remind ourselves an exponential growth function. 2 to the x power. Looks like that. And if I were to put a horizontal line anywhere across this graph, it's only ever going to hit the graph in one point at a time. So yes, this is one to one. It passes the horizontal line test. Since it's one to one, we can say yes, it has an inverse. And therefore, I could create a table of values for that inverse simply by reversing the x's and the y's from the first table. So let's do that right now. I'm going to go ahead and graph both of these functions on the axes. We already know that the original exponential growth function is going to look like what the calculator showed us, but let's graph it more very precisely below just by going ahead and putting these points on the table, or on the graph rather. And there's our familiar exponential growth function with that horizontal asymptote right above the x-axis there, the x-axis being the horizontal asymptote on the negative side. All right, on these same axes, I would now like to go ahead and do the graph of the inverse function. I'll start with the points in the table that we made. So 1 fourth negative 2. 1 half, negative 1, and so on. I can connect these points using a nice smooth curve and begin to see the graph of the inverse function. To the left, it's clearly going up somewhat slowly, but continuing to go up. But I need to think a little bit about what happens over here on the uh, left-hand side. If you remember that inverse functions are always mirror images across the diagonal line, the mirror line y equals x, the diagonal. Then these points over here that were very close to the x-axis, in their mirror image, will actually be down here close to the y-axis. And instead of a horizontal asymptote along the x-axis, what we end up with is a vertical asymptote, where our values get very close but don't cross or touch the y-axis. I'm just going to make a note of that. The inverse has a vertical asymptote. on the negative y-axis. Just like the original function had a horizontal asymptote on the negative x-axis. Can't point it out often enough. Notice how that x and y trade roles again. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about that asymptote later on. But let's go ahead and take a look at the bottom of this page first. 
The inverse certainly does exist. We saw it with the table when we swapped the x and y's. We can see it on the graph. But this actually forms a new type of function that we haven't talked about before in this class anyway. And anytime we have something new, uh, we give it a name. So the name that was selected for this new type of function, the inverse of the exponential function, was the logarithm function. Anytime you have the inverse of an exponential function base b, you'll end up with a logarithm function base b. So notice, just like exponentials have bases, logarithm functions will also have bases. In order to practice the notation a little bit and also get used to the inverse nature of these functions, we're going to create a little chart here showing both the exponential form of some statements and then also the inverse or logarithm form of the same statements. So if I were to say, in exponential form, 2 to the third power is equal to 8. Let me see if I can get the tables of values here. When x equals 3, y equals 8. The inverse statement would be the logarithm base 2 of x, and the inverse x is 8, is equal to 3. Once again, notice how the input and output trade rules. Let's write out a couple more statements, then we can talk about them. 2 to the second power equals 4. That's the exponential form of this statement right here. When you put plug in 2, your output is 4. Looking at the inverse form of that, the input is 4, so I'd have the logarithm base 2 of 4 equals 2. Here's this one, 2 to the first equals 2. That would be that point right there, plugging in x equals 1, gave us 2. So if I look at the inverse statement of that, plugging in x equals 2 over here, the logarithm base 2 of 2 is equal to the output 1. One more down here. 2 to the 0 equals 1. That would be the statement right here when x is 0, y is 1. And here's the inverse of that point. Plugging in 1 for x, the logarithm base 2 of 1 equals 0. All right, we can certainly write them based on the tables of values. But what I'd like you to do is really see the relationship here between the statement of the function, the exponential function, and its inverse, the logarithm. Notice in the logarithm statement, we're given the base, 2, and it's almost like we're told the outcome is going to be 8. And what you have to tell me is what exponent would be necessary to go from a base of 2 to a result of 8. Well, I know 2 to the third power is 8. And that was the original function that it came from anyway. Right? 2 to what power is 4? 2 to the second power. 2 to what power is 2? Two? 2 to the first power. And finally, 2 to what power is 1? 2 to the 0 power is 1. So as the statement at the bottom of the page notes, to find the logarithm base 2 of x, what you're really looking for is the exponent that must be put on the base of 2 to give x. Keeping that in mind, we can go to a more general definition of logarithm for any base. In general, to find the log base b of x, our goal is to say what exponent has to be put on that base of b in order to get x. 
that means there are always two forms that say the same thing. Y is the logarithm base B of X, means the same thing as B to the Y power equals X. These are just the function and the inverse forms of the same statement. All right, we will eventually talk about calculators and logarithms, but in order to get to an understanding of how logarithms work and how to evaluate them, um, I think it's really important that we think through some logarithms without using our calculator. So in each case, I'm going to think about the exponential statement that would allow me to figure out what the missing exponent is, and therefore solve the logarithm. If I have the logarithm base 6 of 36, they told me the base is 6, I'd like to know what power I have to use to get to 36. Of course, 6 squared is 36. And so the power that I needed to use was 2. That means that the solution to the logarithm is 2, or the value of the logarithm is 2. All right, let's try a few more. Base of 3, and the question is, what power do I have to use to get 81? Especially if you kind of know those values from that chart we made a few sections ago, you probably know that 3 to the 4th power is 81. And so the exponent I needed was 4. Therefore, the value of the logarithm is 4. All right, log base 4 of 64. Base is 4. I want to know what exponent I need to get to 64 the exponential statement of the same thing. Since I know that 4 cubed is 64, that missing exponent is 3. And the value of the logarithm is 3. All right, let's look at the next few. This time, I'm taking the logarithm of a fractional value. This number inside the log, we sometimes call it the argument of the logarithm function. So in these next several problems, the argument is a fraction. Let's see how we deal with that. The base is 5, and I want to know what exponent do I have to use to make that 1 25th. Well, first of all, I'm going to remind myself that to make something go into the denominator, I need to use a neg negative exponent. So I know it's going to be a negative power. That's what put it on the bottom. I also know that 5 squared is 25, so that has to be a negative 2. Exponent I used was negative 2, so the value of the logarithm is negative 2. In number 5, 7 to what power? gives me 1 7th. Once again, I'm going to say I know I needed to use a negative power to put it in the denominator. And 7 to the first power is 7. So 7 to the negative 1 is 1 7th. And that exponent, or the value of the logarithm, is negative 1. One more fraction here, fractional argument, I should say. 2 to what power? Gives us 1 32nd. Right away, I know it's going to be a negative exponent in order to put that into the denominator. And I also know that 2 to the 5th power is 32. So the exponent is negative 5. That's the value of the logarithm that I was looking for. All right, a few more. The logarithm base 9 of 3. 9 to what power is 3? 
the first thing I think about here is that it's actually the square root of 9 that's 3. And then I'm just going to remember that square roots are actually fractional exponents, specifically the 1 half power. So this logarithm is 1 half. Logarithm base 8 of 2 asks with a base of 8, what power do I need to get 2? Again, I'm thinking this is actually a cubed root. But a cubed root is the same as a one-third power. Oops, I'm sorry, that was an 8 to the one-third power. So the value of my logarithm is one-third. And then one more example like this. 16 to what power? Gives me one-fourth. First thing I'm going to notice here is it did move to the denominator. So whatever it is, it's going to be a negative exponent. Next, I'm thinking that's a square root, and square roots are one-half powers. So my exponent is negative a half. That's the value of my logarithm. All right. Um, we'll continue in the next video. We'll look at a special case or two, and then we'll also talk about some general properties for logarithms.